So I'm Gabor Zavodsky from Amsterdam. I work uh, at the Computational Science Department of the University of Amsterdam. And um, I've read a couple of registration pages that you submitted before this training so that I have some idea about uh, what level you are on regarding uh, HPC usage. Um, it was almost uh, always from basic to early intermediate. So I thought that maybe a kind of a crash course would be interesting for you, where we actually going to simulate a few things. And uh, as a starter, I really do hope that all of you have access to Maria Nostrum. It's a, it's a yes or it's a no or... This morning it was difficult. Perfect. So let's start with uh, what you can expect from this course quickly. Uh, I will give a really basic introduction to HPC. I really hope that you already got this this morning. And then, uh, in a specified context, which is from the title you can infer, of course, going to be blood flows, we will talk about the most general HPC techniques. We will practically cherry pick a few of them to put together an actual simulation. And uh, during this, obviously, you will face difficulties. So I'm expecting code will not, will, will not compile, things will not work, even if you do exactly everything as it's uh, projected. This is to be expected, and uh, in the end, 99% of the times what happens is that you mistype the character somewhere in the line. But that 1% of uh, chance that you found the bug still exists? Not likely. I tried and tested everything yesterday evening, so it should work, but in case uh, something just doesn't like to work on your computer somehow, then please tell it so that we can more or less keep together. Um, we will compile and modify one HPC application. If you feel adventurous or you are more experienced, then you can go ahead and modify the code, fine tune it, change things. That's all possible, up to you. I will just give a very basic introduction, but you might uh, want to explore on top of it. All right. Uh, I also have to tell you a few things about blood that's not really avoidable since uh, we are going to work with blood flow simulations and um, by the end of this course I really hope that this simulation will be reproducible by all of you in a couple of minutes. So technically what you can expect by the end of it is that you will be capable of running uh, a vessel segment of blood flow on a cellular level. So. In this image, you can see red blood cells and platelets. Red blood cells are, surprise, surprise, the, blood, the red ones. The small little yellow ones are platelets. Red blood cells are carrying hemoglobin, that's why they are red. They carry oxygen around for your body, amongst other things. Platelets are useful for hemostasis, so when you cut yourself, then the first response of the body is to attach these small yellow uh, platelets close to the injury, and then it can just cover the hole and stop the bleeding. This is, uh, these two cell types are the most common in, in human blood. And uh, as a starter, we will use these. But of course, with this framework, later if you are interested or you choose an academic career or so many ifs in the line, but if, then you can add multiple cell types on your own or modify the properties of this. How does it fit in the bigger picture? So, um, what we usually do is we use a full body one dimensional model to compute uh, different properties of the blood flows throughout the human blood body and then we pick point a smaller segment. For example, this one is a segment of, uh, of uh, the circle of Willis which is in your brain and you can see a small secular form on top of it that's called an aneurysm and it's not really healthy. If you happen to have one then you are in extreme danger. Uh, this is a serious disease because in case this secular shape ruptures, it causes uh, hemorrhage, bleeding in the brain, which is uh, one of the reasons people can get stroke. So as a sample application, we usually scan with either MRI or uh, substraction angio angiography patient vessel structures. So we can set up a general one-dimensional model and then a patient-specific a smaller segment in 3D, from which we select a few interesting points, like close to the wall, close to some implanted medical device, and so on. 
which we want to model on a cellular level. And at that point, we are using ChemoCell. Uh, for example, this flashy video, which is not really scientific, but I think it looks cool, was generated with ChemoCell as well. And uh, this is also something that you are expected to be able to do uh, after just a short introduction. Not the visualization, that's a bit uh, more complicated, but the simulation itself. So in these cases, uh, again, an aneurysm, just as before, the treatment method, one treatment method looks like with a catheter, they go up through the arterial system and expand a mesh-like structure. I'm not sure it's really visible, um, even less from afar, but maybe on the magnification you can see that this is a mesh. And the diameter of these struts of the mesh is something like 30 micron. Now, a single red blood cell is about 10 micron in diameter, so these, even, even if these are mechanical devices, the typical length scale, so to say, is comparable to the diameter of a red blood cell. And for that reason, to understand the mechanical behavior of blood when it flows through this surface, we have to use cellular simulations. So down here you can see a typical cellular simulation where we just pick point a small cross-section from, uh, from this mesh. And then we want to explore how these platelets travel around this mesh. From this we can infer information like how thrombogenic this mesh is. So when, uh, when it's implanted in a patient, will a thrombus form or not? Sometimes we want to induce a thrombus, sometimes, for example, around the heart, we really, really want to avoid it. So this is a crucial information, and uh, medical companies use these kind of simulations to improve their um, implanted devices. This is, of course, again, done with HemoCell. And uh, again, just a flashy thing. This is an artificial thrombus, something that would form um, at an injury from these platelets. And again, deformable red blood cell flow around this thrombus. Here we wanted to understand how platelets behave behind this thrombus because there is a cell-free layer that forms. And uh, because of margination, the platelet influx to that region is higher, which leads again to thrombogenous areas. And um, <clears throat> to change quickly, so this was the context. We are going to do simulations like this. These are usually medical related, but uh, some of it regards to biology, some of it, anyways, uh, I'm not sure where your interest lies. So that's why I said that you are going to have to learn a little bit about blood now. But now, because HemoCell is a rather large library, we will have to start to compile it. As funny as it sounds, it will take a couple of minutes. So what we are going to do now, uh, I really hope that you have uh, at least shells, whatever your operating system you are using, Mac, Linux, Windows. I will try to give hints to all of those. And I really hope that, yeah, that I included this side, side, slide. So these are the softwares that uh, are going to be useful. Would be nice if all of you would have at least one in each category. These are just suggestions. You can use whatever else. But I'm, I'm sure if you used already uh, Maria Nostrum that you have some kind of an SSH terminal. If you are using Linux, then you can just use a normal terminal emulator and SSH. If you are using Windows, then I suggest PuTTY or Termius. That works uh, for all platform. But uh, is there anybody who doesn't have one of these or a similar alternative from, from the first line? Okay, I take it as a yes. Uh, or if no, next time be faster. Then in the second category, you will need some software to move files from your notebook. Hopefully, you again have at least WinSCP, CyberDuck, or something comparable. If not, this is the best time to download it. Actually, this is the only time, because afterwards we'll move on. As an editor, whatever you want, I suggest these, actually in this order, but up to you. And for a visualizer, you will need Pereview. This is if you want to check the results of your simulation. Hopefully, you do want to check. Um, if you don't have Paraview, then just Google it, download it. It's not that big. Uh, I suggest to use the latest version always, because 
I do think that Paraview is a splendid software, but it's full of bugs. All right. Yep. You suggest like I Paraview five point four four point one. You suggest to install that or there are no So if you have uh, five point four point one, then you're good to go. If you don't have Paraview and download it now, then I suggest this version because it's better. It's already better. Right. Now, assume that you already have these softwares. If you don't, then uh, in the meantime, while I keep talking, it's a habit of mine, I will keep talking. Just, just download stuff, install stuff. Um, we will move on. This is how you can install on Marian Ostrom uh, Himocell. You will need two components. One, Himocell itself, that's available from this site. You can easily navigate to the GitHub repository where you find it. In the GitHub repo, you can just create uh, an archive, a compressed archive, download it on your notebook, then do something similar with Pelabos, navigate to the Pelabos site, and uh, the tar gzip version is what I suggest, download 2.0. So in the end, you will end up with two compressed files on your notebook. Yep? Blackboard? Nope. You do not need these kinds of tools. So this is just a website. If you have internet access here, yeah. I hope, then this is something like 300 kilobytes. This is a few megabytes. But these are small files. You can easily download them. Um, so the first one is hemocell.eu. The second one is pelabos.org. Let's say that we devote like one minute for this. If you already have it, then even better. You just open up an SFTP program, connect to Maria Nostrum, create a folder, and upload these two files in the folder of your choice. And actually, I should do the same. So if you want a sneak peek of the process, then I'm doing it as well. Yes? So did I got it right? We, we can lock in up to the yeah. uh, model yeah. We don't need these tools, or do we still need these tools? You still need these tools. These two codes you are going to compile and perhaps modify and run. Yeah. Th this is the source code for the simulation. Paraview is useful for visualize the results. So you are going to be able to run it and see output anyways, but if you want flashy 3D images, then you need Paraview. Okay, you want those so what are the chances that the Pelabos site is down? Yeah, it's low. Ah. Not down. Okay. I suggest to go to GitHub, which is, yes. Right. Who is already done with this process? I see two fingers from two different persons. That's nice. OK.
Right. So hopefully this is where everybody are. Still two fingers or now more? Third one. Fourth. Good. Keep up. In the meantime, if you are ready, then I suggest to use your SSH tool to log in to your account in Maria Nostrum so that we can save time with that as well. Right. So if you have a folder now on Maria Nostrum and you have these two compressed files in it, then the following steps are to uncompress the source code and, and set it up for compilation. I will, uh, I will tell it step by step what happens. So first, in my scenario, I created a folder called work. That's always a good start. We are going to work. Then uh, I uploaded, that was the previous side, slide, the two compressed files inside that work folder. And then I will unzip the Hemo cell first, which is the compressed archive from GitHub. Now, if we uncompress this, it's going to create a folder called Hemo cell master and a lot of source code files in it. The next step is that I take the Pelabos source code and copy it into that folder under the name palabos underscore dev tar gz blah blah com compressed file again. This is because Hemocell contains a convenience function that will look for this file and then uncompress palabos, patch palabos and do some black magic in the background for you so that you don't have to. When you're done with that, you can just change to this Hemocell master folder, which now contains Pelabos compressed as well, and run this setup SH. This script will actually uncompress the Pelabos source code, patch it, and that's it. Yep? Do we have now to download the same on our computer or on, the, on our notebook? So the thing is with Maria Nostrum that because of security reasons, it do not have, does not have any outgoing connection. That means that from the terminal, you cannot initiate a download. That's why you have to download it to your notebook and copy it from your notebook to Maria Nostrum, because this is a one-way connection. Ah. Sure, you're welcome. Keep asking, because these might be relevant to the others as well. Thanks. So how many people have reached this point? That's like one, or you are really passive? I'm waiting because Bella Nostrum is not uh, responding at the moment. That's nice, okay. <laughs> so if it happens often, I do have Spotify, we can put on some music. Do tell me if it's not visible from the back, because not that I can magnify it, but I can read it again. Right, so if somebody managed to get at this point, then uh, I suggest to go ahead with the compilation because the number of login nodes is limited. I think there are four login nodes. If we all start to compile on those, it's again gonna be a little bit problematic. So, if you run this setup SH, 
it will yield lots of lines and in the end it will say patching palabos blah 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 a couple of lines and the last line should be done with a smiley maybe so if you see that then you can go ahead and source this file um, HPC programming I hope that you if you ever logged in you are familiar to some extent with the module system that all kinds of compilers and versions are organized into modules because all source code have different dependencies so to compile a source code you have to choose the appropriate modules now because we do not want to do it right here there is a script that I prepared for you a few days ago that already contains the modules on Maria Nostrum you need to compile him or self. This bash file has all those modules and technically sourcing it is uh, a method how you load all the content of this uh, bash script and uh, emerge it on the current level of the bash. Let's say you load it. Now the thing is that I used to teach in classes where there is a glass background so that I can see the reflection of the screens and I can tell where you are at. Now I don't have this, so I will step out of the frame for a moment. All right, so let's say that this is the prompt of your notebook. I obviously don't have Linux, but I can log into a Linux machine and do the same. Hopefully you see something from it. This tool is called Midnight Commander. I can make it bigger like this, but it will not help because the characters are not bigger. So this is a file manager for Linux. And what you can easily do is with F9 invoke a menu on the right side. And you will find a menu item called shell link. Sorry? MC. So for everybody using Linux. A small M and a small C. I suggest you to get to know this application if you are using Linux. Now, with the shell link, here you just type the normal SSH login, what you are using. Username at what's that? MN1.bhc.es. And then the right panel will contain your files on Maria Nostrum. And you can use it as a normal file manager to copy stuff between your computer and Maria Nostrum, back and forth. <coughs> All right. Magic question, how many people could get over the setup of the source code? All right, so for you, I would like to ask to go ahead and uh, source my Nostrum environment file. That's technically source, that's the command, one space. Then in the script folder, there is a my Nostrum env sh as a first argument. And after you sourced it, head to the cases folder select the stretch cell case that is to change into that folder and execute compile sh because this is going to take like 10 minutes to compile at least yeah this is going to take some time so in the meantime i'm going to talk a little bit about what we are going to do once you are done with this task at least Right? So, do you still have active questions or you are okay fighting with whatever problem came up? Ready? And that's why you needed to download two separate files. It's based on Pelabos. Pelabos is a lattice Boltzmann computational fluid dynamic package. That one was the larger one. And HemoCell technically is an extension on top of it which uh, adds cellular mechanics. So what happens there is that we are using Pelabos as a low-level library. It deals, as I've said, with the fluid component, which is for blood, is the blood plasma. We will model it as an incompressible Newtonian fluid. 
And we add the few facilities, that is inverse boundary method and load balancing library, and uh, all these cell mechanics on top of it, and we call that hemo cell. That means that all our cells are going to use immersed boundary method. If you're not familiar with it, uh, I, will, I will introduce it in a few words. And uh, we will explore this whole source code up to this first box, how red blood cells and platelets works in this uh, environment. Now, the HPC part is also kind of hidden in Palabos. So um, this is the part where we handle the Domain, maybe I will have some few images for that later. But the domain decomposition, MPI calls, and by the way, we are using MPI as, uh, as our HPC platform. That's the message passing interface, if you are familiar with it. Anybody who has not heard about MPI yet, ever? OK. What, what was the previous two courses about? Uh, general is uh, Total general. Bash, um, HPC, uh, I see. OK. OK. So just quickly then, what we are doing with MPI is that we define these tasks. We have the whole computational domain, which is going to be like a vessel segment for us now. But obviously, we cannot compute it on a single core in a reasonable time. So what we want to do is subdivide the whole domain into smaller chunks. Each smaller chunk is going to be one task. What we know about one task is that it can access local memory and exchange information with other tasks. Now, the important part about MPI, why it's useful for you, is that these tasks do not have to reside on the same computer. So some tasks might be deposited on a different node. And whenever they are exchanging information, the underlying network interface is automatically handled for you. Otherwise, it would be a little bit difficult, because let's say that you want to send a number from task 0 to task 1. You want to send a number 5. Then you have to know whether these two tasks are on the same computer, in which case this is just a memory copy. Or they are on completely different nodes, in which case you have to send it through something, usually an infinite band here, I guess. But this you don't have to worry about at all, because it's handled by MPI. And all the data structure decomposition, how we subdivide our big domain, is handled by Palabos. So we are going to do a higher level and application level programming, and not really worry about the low level things. Um, but if you have not heard about it, then one more thing I would like to point out, that uh, the information exchange between these tasks require symmetric interface, meaning that whenever you are sending data from one, then the corresponding task that will get this data have to call a receive function. This might not seem like a big difference or a, or a big deal for you, but this makes this whole programming stuff a little bit more complicated because whenever you are running a code, let's say in task zero, and you want to send something and you invoke a send function, then you have to make sure that wherever this task two is, which is on another computer, remember, it has to arrive to a receive function. Because unless this send function couldn't complete the whole data sending procedure, it cannot continue. So if you create your program asymmetrically in a way that, for example, this task contains two send functions while the receiver part only one receive, then you will technically hang your program because this will wait for another receive forever, which will never happen. This is something to keep in mind, but today we will not worry about this that much. Um, the domain decomposition will work more or less like this, meaning that this is a curved channel now with some flow in it. Let's imagine that this is a huge domain, not just a couple of numerical nodes, but maybe millions of numerical nodes. Now, wherever you see color, that's a flow, fluid. Wherever you see blue, that's practically wall. There is no flow there. Uh, from our computational point of view, that's not an important domain. One thing that we could do is to only keep in the memory and in computation those numerical cells that has fluids in them because the rest makes no computation anyways. Now, this is a little bit difficult with, uh, or not really difficult, but not the optimal way in Lattice Boltzmann, 
because for the fluid we are using an Eulerian grid, uh, a regular grid. You can just uh, imagine a big mesh where every numerical node is a cube, like a voxelized space in 3D. So instead of keeping track whether a voxel is inside or outside the computational domain, we just subdivide it, in this case, to three different Lattice-Boltzmann simulations, which can exchange some information on the boundaries. This is much more effective because then we do not need to keep a lookup table somewhere that will tell us whether a node is a wall or a fluid or what happens with it. Each node can be handled the same way, which is really good for parallelism. It is so good that actually if you implement this on a GPU, you can usually get from a tenfold to hundredfold speed up compared to a high-end CPU, which is very rare with, uh, even with parallel applications. So Lattice Boltzmann is extremely parallel, and that is part of the reason why we chose it for an HPC application. Now, the cells on top of it are a little bit more problematic. They are usi using Lagrangian points. So what you can see here is, let's say this is a cross-section of a platelet. The red mesh are the fluid nodes, which is a regular grid. And on top of it, we have uh, a cell defined by several surface points that flow in this domain. And of course, since it's a coupled simulation, so fluid structure interaction has to happen, meaning that the flow field has to interact with this membrane of the cell. Uh, you can imagine that it's kind of complicated since the fluid cells are on a, on a different grid from the membrane points. So the way how we actually interact, how we exchange information between them, is using this immersed boundary method that technically takes the surroundings of a single node like, like this one. And then this point reads all the velocity values in this uh, blue square. And we can use different interpolation kernels to extract one single data from the area covered by this uh, square. What that technically means is that on the membrane we need to know the fluid velocity at this specific point. Our cell is somewhere, we want to know the fluid velocity at that point. We technically look around this node point, check the velocities in these nine squares, and we interpolate, not necessarily linearly, there are different methods how to interpolate more accurately. And uh, the information exchange back to the fluid happens the same way. We have some forces on this port, point, we want to exert it upon the fluid, so we get these nine fluid nodes and interpolate the force on them somehow using a kernel. This is technically the immersed boundary method. And the combination of Lattice Boltzmann and immersed boundary in the end will yield a highly parallel simulation like this one where every single colored box is a different task in the previous MPI picture. So not necessarily a separate node. Maybe these two boxes are on the same node. Maybe they are in completely different machines. We do not know that, but that's handled by a lower level code. And while the fluid field is always in place, so while the cells are moving, the underlying fluid nodes, of course, stay the same. So each computational task will handle always the same fluid nodes but the cells are flowing on top of that, so they are coming and going in and out from the computational nodes. That causes problematic things like, maybe this is the easiest to see, if uh, we are looking at the full domain, you can see that it's um, um, cubic, let's say. So even if we have a round object like a pipe, there are nodes here that are technically empty. They are still assigned to, to some node, to some computational course, but they don't do a thing. That's where actually uh, this load balancing library comes into play because it just evaluates the hematocrit, the amount of cells everywhere. And if you have more cells, for example, in the middle, then we will create smaller subzones there or assign more cores there or do something clever so that the overall efficiency is optimal. And the problem or the difficulty here is that throughout the simulation, this of course changes. Red blood cells move, and uh, actually after a while, in the middle, the amount of hematocrit, the amount of red blood cells will increase. So this load balancing uh, step has to be carried out over and over again. And uh, at points where we feel that 
the amount of red blood cells, the distribution of the red blood cells changed a lot. We have to checkpoint the whole simulation, save its state, so to say, and then reassign the computational cores to the whole domain. This is uh, something that you will experience frequently with, with high-end HPC applications, that one of the main target is to achieve as high performance as possible. Otherwise, if it would not be a, an issue, then you just use your notebook and Python, because developing in that is so much more efficient and fast. But in this application, scientifically, the better domain we can simulate, the bigger is the better. So we want to squeeze out every drop of performance possible. And then you go to HPC tools and uh, do things like this load balancing. Now, uh, equations doesn't matter here. What I want to point out that for every single red blood cell that you just saw, we have uh, something like 600 surface points connected by 2,000 edges forming a bit more than 1,000 triangles. And all these mechanical forces, these equations, are written up on these numerical uh, points. Now, that means that overall, a red blood cell has something like 4,000 degrees of freedom to solve every iteration. You can imagine that that's kind of huge. So that is the reason why we move this whole thing toward HPC. Um, we will get to that. It's a very good question. Um, technically, the mechanical responses of the cell require that. So if we lower the amount of surface points, then there are a couple of mechanical responses it can no longer reproduce. This 600-something is practically the lowest. That's, that's still okay. So uh, in, a, in an optimal world, we'd like to use 10 times this much. But, uh, yeah, so... To point out something again, I think that by now you have the feeling that moving with these kind of applications is, uh, is a bit tedious. You have to work a lot. It's not because of Hemo cell. You're already fighting with different kind of problems, how to unzip it, how to move it to the supercomputer, how to compile it, how to something. It's not really related to Hemo cell. Whenever you are using an open source code on an HPC machine, you should expect these kind of problems, even more so when you start to compile it, a code that's not been prepared, for example, for Maria Nostrum, then uh, you will get all kinds of, of dependency error, incompatibilities, and so on. So this is something you have to factor in, that if you want to use this kind of facility, then the development times are usually much longer, because the usual trade-off that why you are using Python is that developer time is so much more expensive than computational time. It's no longer true here. We want to go for the highest performance, so developer time becomes cheaper compared to computational time. Of course, we are talking about huge computational times, and I will uh, show how we could optimize HemoCell with a few strategies. But uh, first, let's take a look at these strategies. The previous slide was about code optimization. I don't want to go into that because that's really technical. It's about how you can optimize the branching points, how you can uh, assess which is the most likely branching point so that you, you reorganize the code to have the fastest execution there and so on. But, but there are a few smart ideas, and I would like to show two of those, that can speed up the application without really, really deep code logic modifications. One is that usually you want to have an initial condition closest to the solution. In this case, that means that if you download other competing codes, not HemoCell, but something else, usually if you set up your simulation, then you will get a domain like this, because the code just puts down in a regular grid all the red blood cells, all the platelets, all whatever. Then, of course, at the point where you can actually make measurements in, uh, in your simulation, you want a well-mixed system, something like this. Between these two, there are millions of iteration steps. Technically, you have to simulate a lot, to get to a point where you can start a meaningful simulation. That's usually a problem. So for us, uh, one optimization strategy was to figure out a way to start from a, from a better initial condition. Now, 
we developed a separate simulation to help initialize our simulation that uh, practically covers all the red blood cells with ellipsoids and then employ a really fast simulation, fast collision detection to, to arrange them in a way that first they put them down randomly and they are small. Then it starts to grow them. And while they are growing, we can fastly compute or quickly compute the overlapping areas of these ellipsoids and they can push each other away proportionately to the overlapping volume. That in the end, depending on whether we allow rotation uh, like here or we do not allow rotation, so just the positions are random, we will get a randomly mixed system. And this kind of computation is really, really cheap compared to the previous mechanical model and whatever, because here these are hard ellipsoids. No mechanical model there, no deformation there. So um, you can imagine that it's practically a Newtonian simulation where we compute forces and then move and rotate them accordingly. And I will uh, show you in a moment how much uh, computational time it can save. The other strategy, which is quite usual, so one was that, of course, you can do code optimization, then you can choose better initial conditions, then you can introduce some adaptivity. In this simulation, there are three different time scales that can be separated from each other. One is for the fluid field that steps every iteration. One is for the coupling between the cells and the fluid. And one is for the material model of the, fluid, uh, of the cells itself. So you can see that this material model is actually the most expensive one. That's where we use those 600 points and 2,000 uh, angles and uh, edges and uh, 1,200 something triangles. So that's where we compute about uh, 4,000 equations per cell. But it turns out that with Larry's Boltzmann, the, fu uh, the fluid time scale is really, really short, meaning that one iteration is something like 10 to the power minus 8 seconds. And during that time, the response of the mechanical model of the cell is barely something that changes. So the gradient of that is, is almost zero. And for that reason, we can do tricks like, OK, the fluid structure interaction, we keep it the same for a couple of iterations. And we only update the mechanical model, let's say, every 15th or 100th step. This is uh, just the scale separation, but then if you want to do it the best possible, because the whole system in a, in a complicated geometry is not really predictable. So you cannot say in advance that, okay, if I update it every 50th step, then it's gonna be cool. It will not explode numerically, it's gonna be stable, it will converge to the, to the real result that I want. This is usually not known in advance, because the hematocrit profile develops, because the whole flow develops. So we can introduce some adaptivity, and in this case, what I did is uh, I always query the largest force in the whole flow system. I check all the cells and all the cell surface points for the largest appearing force. And if it is below a threshold, let's say the blue one, uh, sorry, green one, almost, then I can keep increasing uh, how big step I take with the material model. On the right side, so these are correlated figures. On the right side, you can see that now we keep this time step at 50. Every 50th fluid iteration, we step one. That is not too frequent. So at some point, it will lead to numerical instabilities, which manifest first as large forces in the system. We can see here around 800,000 iteration that the forces are rising. We go over our green threshold, Within this domain, we don't change anything. If we are below green, then we can increase the time step size. If we are within here, then we just observe the system and don't take any action. And if we leave this red threshold, then we start to decrease the time step. So you can see that as soon as the system, the largest force in the system is past this threshold, we quickly decrease the step size. That means that we update the material model more often that will lead to a more accurate and numerically more stable uh, solution. But then, as we increased the frequency of the updates, the total for the largest force starts to drop. It drops below the red threshold. We don't do anything here because this is just an observing zone. But then it drops below green, at which point 
we start to increase the step size, saving computational time, because it seems like that the system is stable enough as it is. And at that point, it quickly goes into the observation zone. So we stop increasing the step size. And then when it goes back again, then we put it. So something happened in the system, like jamming of particles or very strong collision of two red blood cells, something that increased the forces and required a much finer grade resolution. And that is something that you can introduce with adaptivity. We save a lot of time here. Then when we really have to compute something, then we change back. And there we don't save really computational time, but that's the best we can do. And when it's possible, we change back again. Yes? Uh, when you draw uh, yep. your iteration uh, size, yep. uh, which previous solution do you use? Um, the top, the bad one? Here, actually, it's not a, a single drop. It's just many, many iterations. But technically, it's a small, uh, it has a slope. But it's you start from the solution at the peak? I, I start from here, and I hope that the error vanishes. Oh, okay. So, so at, at at this point, the system already contains errors. But uh, here I aim for numerical stability. Because it would be too costly to actually take the n minus 1 solution down in the n minus 2. Because it's very difficult to say how much solution steps I have to go backwards, which do not contain. So if I wind back time and start from here, it's not guaranteed that it will give a more accurate solution. But yeah, it's a very good observation. So in the end, how much it saved us? Um, the particular simulation in discussion originally took something like a year. Then we added some code optimization, which shaved off like uh, half of it, a bit more than half of it. Then we added the additional simulation with initial conditions. That again meant like a factor of four degrees in computational time. And then lastly, we included adaptivity, which then increased the performance more than tenfold. The bottom line is that even if you take out this code optimization, which uh, needs a professional, so we have a, a very talented guy in our group. He's really deep in the matrix and can do all these optimizations. But even if you don't have this, but rather know what the question that you want to ask, and uh, think smartly a little bit, then you can save at least 10 times in this case. So we could bring down this one year uh, computational time to two days, which is, which is really doable. And uh, in this hemocell environment, that means that now we can do something like two cubic millimeter of full blood. That means approximately eight, a bit more than eight million cells. At the moment, this is the largest we can do, but of course we are preparing for the exascale age, so we want to scale it up even further. However, now, hoping that many of you could already compile at least the code. So, quick check, sorry, how many of you could compile it successfully? That's a lot. You're good. All right, so then, we will uh, reproduce one of the validations of, uh, of red blood cells first. That's one of the reasons why we need so many surface points. This validation is uh, actually it's one of the standard tests also for, for red blood cells, how they assess their mechanical properties. What you can imagine is that they take one single red blood cell and attach two silica beads to the two opposing sides. And then there are techniques uh, usually called optical tweezer techniques, where they can focus lasers on these silica beads and keep them in place. Now imagine that the left one is fixed in space and you start to pull the right one. You will end up pulling the cell something like I see on my screen and you don't see on the other one. But then I will show a video. So, uh, yeah, it looks something like this, but of course you can stretch it even more. And then what happens is that you can measure the smaller and the larger cross-section of the red blood cell. And as you increase the stretching force, of course the largest diameter is going to grow. 
and the cross-sectional diameter, the cross diameter is going to decrease as you stretch it. Now, there is one simulation already set up for this. And, uh, and I would like you to run it. That means that at the compilation step, hopefully you compile the, the case called cell stretch, stretch cell. And uh, Hemocell is organized such a way that in the case folder there are pre-made cases set up for you. This is the smallest one. To run it, I would like you to set this uh, T measurement tag in the config XML to 1000. That means that you will save one state of the simulation every thousands iteration. And then here is some very, very bad practice. And if somebody asks you, it was not me who told this. Someone else, and he already left. So you can run this stretch cell, and the first argument you should give it is this config XML. What's going to happen, of course, is that Hemo cell code will start up on the login node. Maybe, maybe we should cut it from the video afterwards. And uh, because on the login node, you should never run anything. It will take one core, use this config XML, which contains all kinds of information, like what's the force you want to stretch with, what are the mechanical properties of the cell, so on. You can just check the XML file. It's very well commented. It will do one or two minutes of calculation. Then we'll greet you with a smiley at the end. And at that point, you can use a script that will take all these output files and create the preview version from them. That means that from the folder of this uh, case, you can run this dot dot dash dot dot dash scripts batch post process. That will do a lot of stuff for you. But ultimately, it will leave you with the folder within this case file folder called TMP, a temporary folder. And that whole folder, you can move to your notebook to check out with preview. And um, OK, I will leave it up for a little while. And if you need help, we can again devote like five minutes or so. So I can try to help to compile and run it. Then uh, you can use this post-process post script to generate the preview files. And if you have done that, then uh, using the same method how you moved files to Mario Nostrum, move the whole TMP folder back this TMP folder back to your notebook, where usually, or hopefully, you already have Perevi. And uh, I will come back to this slide for those who need it. And uh, in Perevi, in the file menu, you can use open file. And if you navigate into this TMP folder that you've just created with the simulation, then you will see red blood cell, platelet, and fluid field files. Now, I would suggest to first select the red blood cell files and use the XDMF reader. Perview will pop up an option what reader you want to read in the simulation data. And from that, use the XDMF1, not the XDMF3, because that have some compatibility issues currently. And this XDMF reader will just read in whatever file type you select from this folder fine, like um, red blood cells, platelets, fluids. If you read in red blood cells, then on the left side on the properties panel, you have to press apply. This is because Perview is uh, prepared for very large data sets. So it's typically a tool for HPC application output visualization. And uh, unless you apply some command, it will never start to do it because you might load in a three terabyte data set. And if you accidentally press something you don't want to and it starts a computation for the next three weeks, that might not be good. So it will always ask for uh, some confirmation, whatever you do. But after you press apply, then it will automatically read in the red blood cell. Uh, and you can give different colors on the toolbar for it. For example, in this sample, I colored it by the force exerted on the cell. And you can see that, and you will see on your version, that the two end of the cell is colored differently, meaning that we are forcing it here and here. If you remember, this is the place of the two silica beads, how we stretch our cell. And since you've saved multiple times from the simulations, you can use this play button and uh, the rest of the buttons to step back and forth in time. So you can animate your simulation, how the cell is being stretched. 
And of course, you can apply all kinds of filter. You can cut it, slice it, color it by different forces, check out how the viscous forces work. You can also read in the fluid field if you want. That's again going to the open menu, navigate, blah, blah, and open the fluid files. Then in the same window, you will have a fluid background as well on which you can add, for example, arrows for velocity. You can check the velocity around this cell while you are stretching it, how it evolves. You can also check for platelet files in simulations where you actually have platelets. Here it's just a single red blood cell. So you will have red blood cell and fluid. If you can, then please do check out how it looks in Pereview. And for the rest of you, I try to help you to get here. This is just uh, an introductory application from Hemocell. I really would like to move on so that uh, we can create an actual blood flow in a vessel, not just a single red blood cell. That would be a bit more interesting, I think. All right. For now, you can all follow a little bit because we will use this additional simulation within the simulation where we prepare uh, initial conditions. That's a separate program which is easy to compile so all of you can join again. And then afterwards we will move to actually setting up a larger pipe flow, a larger section of, of vessel with many red blood cells and platelets. And uh, if you can do that, then uh, of course run a simulation practice a little bit how to submit a job to a supercomputer because that's something we've been missing so far. And hopefully you can visualize that as well. But for now, I will tell about this later, but as uh, experience dictates, let's first try the code part because that will take time and then I can put the story around it. So first, we would like to have the program that generates the initial conditions. For that, of course, you cannot read it because it's a little bit uh, blurred. But first, we just move to the root of Hemocell folder. And then there is a folder called Tools. Within there is, I guess, just a single folder called Pack Cells. This Pack Cells uh, code is going to pack our cells in a domain in a mixed way. And hopefully, because many of you had this problem previously, there was a step at the first compilation where there was a command called source, and then we sourced the environment file for Maria Nostrum. That's important because that will load the proper compiler for you, and you can test if it works using uh, the module command, which is just module, a space, and then you can give some comments to it afterwards if you press enter list, then it will list all the modules that already loaded. If you do that and in, you li in the list somewhere you see GCC and Python 2.7 point something, then you already sourced the file and loaded the proper modules. If you don't see that, then you should use this command source. I missed the U, but yeah. And then you can give a bash file that the source will load to the top level of bash. And within scripts, there is a Mare Nostrum something something sh file. So if you use source with that script file, it will load all the modules you need in case you don't find them loaded already. Now let's assume that you have this, and even if you don't, I think this code compiles with the default compiler as well. You don't need additional modules. So go into this Pexel folder and execute compile sh. Simplest possible stuff. It should finish the execution like in 10 seconds. If you have that, then within this Pexels folder, you will have a Pexel executable. If you execute it without any additional arguments, it will just list a small help how to use it. But practically, it takes three dimensions in microns. In this case, it's 40 micron times 20 times 20, which means that we are setting up a domain like this. which is not really proportional, but you get it. This is 40 micron, 20 by 20. A very small capillary, let's say. Now, why would it be visible? So it's a double, uh, double dash. 
one argument that you can give is hematocrit, which we put at 0.2. That means that the whole volume will contain, I don't know, something like 60, 40 red blood cells. 20% of the total volume is going to be red blood cells. And then again, double dash allow rotate. That we just allow that the original randomly positioned red blood cells push them around, push each other around and rotate in the meantime. So they will not be axis aligned. That's something we want because that will result in a well-mixed system. Now, if you run it, this is where the bad practice thing comes in because this code uses an other type of uh, parallelism. It's not MPI parallel, it's open MP parallel. If you haven't heard of that either, then just in a nutshell, it's, uh, it's a shared memory parallelism, so it will not handle network code. It will only initiate tasks on your local computer. Now it's a, local, it's a login node, so what happens, it asks the login node how many cores are available, which should be, I don't know, 20, 24 maybe, and then it will start a process in each one of them. And of course, in the login node, there are processes running in the background checking for whatever you are doing. And it will notice that you just hijack all the cores so nobody else can use it as a login node. And it will kill the application. But you can nicely experience it yourself if you start it up. So after you've done this, uh, there are several ways how it actually should be used. One is that you can request an interactive session. That's typical for development on HPC computers that you want to spend some time developing like uh, the compilation at the beginning took five to 10 minutes at least. Now if uh, 30 of you starts up that compilation, that will be a burden on the login nodes. So normally what you would do is request an interactive session. That means it's, uh, it's very similar than submitting a job, but you say that you also want the output and the shell of, of uh, the assigned node. So it's the same as submitting something to the supercomputer, but you will get the, no, the actual uh, shell as well. And within that, now you can run the same command because that's no longer, in theory, that's no longer the login node. Sometimes it can be a login node as well, depends on the system. But the general idea is that you will get one node from the computational part of the, of the cluster, not the login node, and then you can do whatever on that. And of course, when you are using these facilities, there is some kind of a budget, right? So this is usually not free. Within a training or so, you have free access, but normally you win a fund or a grant or something, and then you get a million core hour or so. So whenever you are submitting a job and it runs for several hours using several cores, you multiply them and that's how many core hours they will use up. The interactive session uses the same. So whenever you are using it, it will cost your budget. But for now, for this training, it's of course uh, constrained but free. Now in your interactive session, you can run this code and it will generate your randomized positions within such a domain for red blood cells that will take 20% of the volume. Could you run it or is it possible to see it at all or should I? So this is, okay, the first command is bhc underscore queues. If you execute that, it will show all the queues that you have access to. A queue is usually a part of the HPC machine. So for now, we are aiming for the interactive queue because those are the machines from which you can request an interactive shell. And then there is this s alloc in cell lock, which is uh, part of the Slurm package. That's why this is an S, S for Slurm. Slurm allocation, which you use with a minus P interactive that just says that you want an allocation on the interactive queue. If you execute this, then you will get back some uh, text saying that, okay, you are waiting for being processed. And then whenever there is a free node available on the HPC computer, then you will get an interactive queue, an interactive shell on this, uh, yeah, on this queue. So could you, get, could you catch it or should I tell it again? Or, so I need some feedback now from you. Is it okay? Can you do it yes. with this amount of information? Perfect. One question? Yes? It should run in a couple of two minutes tops. 
So if you run it, then, uh, but it's a randomized thing, so I cannot tell you for sure. Depends on how they were arranged uh, at the beginning. But uh, you will see a couple of columns, and in the last column there is something called total force. That's the total amount of force how, with which the overlapping uh, ellipsoids push each other away. So when that reaches zero, then it's a force-free configuration, no overlap happens, then it's cool. It will stop. It should decrease. Right. Now let's assume that you've done this, in which case you will end up with two position files, a platelet and a red blood cell. You can copy these to the pipe flow case directory and uh, they will serve as initial positions for the red blood cells and platelets within the pipe flow. And then you can also compile the pipe flow case. This compilation is going to be fast because the, the previous long compilation was about compiling the Pelabos and the Hemocell library. They are cached. So now you are just compiling a small file and link them to that library. It's gonna be a couple of seconds. And if you've done this, you can start up this pipe flow on the login node just to check if everything works. And uh, you can kill it with control C or that nice script will kill, kill it for you. Um, and if everything works as advertised it should, then, uh, well, then you have a choice. In your interactive session, you have access to four cores, if I'm correct. That's the default configuration of Maranostrum. That means that this, this um, pipe flow you can execute on four cores. That's going to work like, hopefully I have, if not. Yes, so one way to do that is using MPI run with uh, the parameter four that the number of processes is four and you just put behind the normal execution uh, command that you would use for one core. But you prepend it with MPI run, oh sorry, this should be a small m, with MPI run minus NP4, meaning that four process for this command. And it will just start in the interactive session. You can also check that if you start it on two cores, then approximately it will take twice as much time to compute an iteration. Because if you manage to run it, it will print all kinds of statistics, how much it takes to compute an iteration, what's the largest force, all kinds of numbers. And then you can play with it. So if you increase this number, then of course the performance will increase, but not linearly. That's because of the communication overhead between the tasks. If you have some result, you don't necessarily have to wait too long, you can kill it whenever. If you see that it already saved a couple of iterations, then you can also already close it down with Control-C, for example. And then the same process applies that if you run batch post process from the folder, it will create pair view files that you can copy to your notebook and see it in 3D how your flow looks like. Also with, uh, with the fluid field. And uh, we will not have time to talk about the fluid field, but the same techniques that you visualized the single cell work here as well. Right? And just so you, I, I can come back here and help you a little bit, but just so you know what you can expect still from these slides, because if afterwards you will have access to it, then there is still a job file. This is the usual way how you use an HPC computer that first, you develop your stuff on your local machine, wherever. Then on the login node, you can try to compile it. If it compiles in the interactive session, you can test it for short runs. And if everything is going well, and you feel like that the config file is set up already, and uh, it behaves the way you want it to, the output's fine, then basically you want to submit it for a longer run. Let's say we want a second of time, a heartbeat cycle out of our simulation that takes something like 10 million iteration loops. It's a lot. You will not want to wait that at an interactive shell. Rather, you create a script file that looks like this. This is an actual script file for, uh, for the current pipe flow that you are compiling, hopefully now, uh, that works. I just checked it yesterday. What it says is that you give a name to the job. This is arbitrary, whatever you want. You specify where the output goes, because you will not have a shell for this execution. So it, you will send the job into the cluster. It will execute whenever. It will have free resources for it to execute. But you don't see an interactive output. 
to have an output, you have to define that, okay, everything that goes on to my standard output or the error output goes into this and this file. Then you can specify how many tasks you want to run, which queue. For now, you only have access to the training queue with these accounts, so it can be only the training queue. How much time you allow for it, this is crucial. So this is, this is part of why you need to make measurements in the interactive queue, because then you know that one iteration takes this many time, I want to run for 10 million iterations, so you multiply the two and you get that, okay, I will run for five days or something. Right now it's set for four minutes. So you set some time here, and then at the last command, you actually give the command line with which you execute your simulation and prepend it with srun. This is slurm run. Slurm will take all these parameters and set up an environment accordingly and execute your command at some point. And uh, when you successfully submitted your job, which you can do with this command, s batch, and then you give the command file. This is what's in this job command file. With s batch, you can submit it. Uh, this learn manager will process it. And then you can use this sq command to check all your, all your processes within the, uh, the HPC computer. So you can imagine that, OK, I have 20 different simulations to do. But since when I submit something, I do not know for sure when it will be completed, because I do not know for sure when it's going to be started. Since it will only start, if I request, let's say, 2,000 cores, and there are just half of it available, then it has to wait in a queue. At some point, there's going to be enough free processor, then it will start to execute, and it will finish at some point. But if I have multiple simulations, I don't want to wait. I can submit as many jobs as my budget allows. And then with this command, I can check out the different jobs, what's their status, if they are processing, if they are executing, what happens to them. And in the unfortunate case that you submit something that actually you figure out you don't want to, this is, um, it happens often, that you submit something for two months run and then you figure out that one of the parameters was not okay, then of course you don't have to wait for two months and uh, blow all the budget. You can cancel it. With the SQ, you can check the ID of that job and then give a cancellation comment towards the job manager that, no, you don't want that to execute. Right. And uh, with this, actually, I would like to thank you for your attention. I really hope that after accessing the slides, you can recreate some part of it, even if you could not read what's on the table, even if uh, there was some problem with copying files, so on. You can, of course, iron this out. And then using the slides, you can still run these uh, simulations. And of course, uh, the website of Hemocell is more or less constantly updated. So as we add new features, it will get there. You can just check them out. I think it looks fun, even if you are not going to biomedical still. It looks nice to, to simulate a flow field and then just check out in 3D and slice the cells and so on. So I hope that this whole stuff on the long run is going to be, even if it was too much information at once with too many little nifty details, on the long run, I hope that you can profit from this and learn something and reuse something. So thank you all for your attention today. And uh, yeah, the course goes on. So good luck with that. Thank you.